So good afternoon, everyone. This is Denise Gilman. I direct the Immigration Clinic at the University of Texas Law School here in Austin, Texas. Um, and I'm going to be moderating uh, the webinar today. Um, there is a poll already up on your screens, I believe, that um, should uh, be something that you can answer to just give us a sense of who all is on the, the call. Um, and I'm going to make just a few kind of logistics remarks as you're doing that. Um, so this is a webinar from the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice brought to you by the ABA Commission on Immigration. Um, if you are interested in the work that you hear about today and the work in general of the ABA, uh, we invite you to collaborate with us on projects uh, you want to de develop and offer to our members and, and the public. Um, we're really excited to bring you today's program entitled Remain in Mexico, the facts, the fiction, and methods to challenge this unprecedented rebuke of America's asylum system. Um, we have uh, a number of really great panelists. Um, we have Laura Peña, who is with ProBar, a project of the ABA Commission on Immigration down in Brownsville, Texas, near one of the uh, areas in which MPP is being implemented. We have uh, Patricia Ojeda, who is a staff attorney with the ABA's Immigration Justice Project out in San Diego, another area impacted by MPP. We have Taylor Levy, who is a private immigration attorney in El Paso. She has uh, quite a bit of history working in the El Paso area, previously with Annunciation House, and she's been very involved with the rollout of MPP there in El Paso. We have Laura Toole, who is the pro bono attorney um, for the firm uh, of Jones Day for the firm-wide pro bono program. Um, but she has been very directly involved in the efforts of the firm to provide pro bono services, first in detention in Laredo, Texas on the border, and now uh, for those individuals who are in MPP uh, in the Laredo, Nuevo Laredo area of the border. And we have uh, Lia Chavarria, who is the Director of Immigration Services at Jewish Family Services of San Diego, who so also provides that perspective on MPP uh, in the San Diego, uh, Northern Baja California area where it was initially implemented. Um, in a minute, we're going to ask each of them to give us a bit of a presentation of what they're seeing at the, at the border. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go from that into discussion and questions. Uh, but just a couple of other technical matters. Um, we need to say that the views expressed herein have not been approved by the House of Delegates or the Board of Governors of the American Bar Association and accordingly should not be construed as representing official policy of the American Bar Association. They are the views of the individuals ourselves uh, in our personal capacities. Um, I do want to let you know you can ask questions of the panel uh, by finding the questions drop down box on the on the platform. Uh, it's on the right hand side panel and you can type in your questions and we will have time for answering questions towards the end of the of the program so that the panelists can address those. We will be sharing a recording of the program to everyone who has registered so you can then share it widely with your networks afterwards and please do feel free to leave feedback uh, or ask questions um, to follow up after after the program as well. Um, for more than five decades, the section and its members have worked on hundreds of issues addressing a broad, broad range of civil rights, civil liberties, and international human rights. Today, the section continues to promote policies on religious freedom, LGBT rights, gender equity, and other significant um, civil rights issues. So you might, might want to consider making a donation to the civil rights section, um, and that's at donate.americanbar.org slash CRSG, the section on civil rights and social justice. Um, and uh, with that, I do think that the issue of the Remain in Mexico program formally called MPP uh, certainly raises some of the key civil rights and human rights issues that we are facing in the United States today. Um, there is uh, litigation pending uh, in the Ninth Circuit, challenging wholesale the, the program, but so far, and that's in an injunctive uh, remedy stage, but so far uh, the courts have allowed the program to be implemented and it has rolled out in ways that raise very serious questions of violations of fundamental due process rights and access to court and access to counsel. 
that also call into question the integrity of the asylum system, really um, raising questions about a, an assault on our asylum system and the ability of individuals needing protection to access uh, the, the system that is set forth in US and international law. And also raising questions about the extent to which uh, the US government is actively endangering people, uh, asylum seekers, by returning them to very uh, violent and unstable situations in northern Mexico while they await their hearings and even placing them in a position in which they may be either directly returned to danger in their home countries or essentially uh, forced to, to uh, return themselves to, to their home countries. Um, so with that, we'll ask each of the, the members of the panel from the different regions to tell a little bit more about how and when MPP has been implemented in their areas. And we'll start with Leah talking about San Diego. Oh, and there is another poll up, hopefully two more polls that would give us a sense of where uh, you fall in terms of your awareness and involvement with the Remain in Mexico program. Um, that might be helpful as, as we talk about this. If the poll doesn't apply to you at all, if, you, if you're just here to learn about this and haven't been directly involved at all yet in Remain in Mexico, you don't need to answer the poll. But if you do have some involvement, it would be helpful to know what that looks like. Thank you. Go ahead, Leah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I uh, am the director of immigration services at Jewish Family Service in San Diego. I just wanted to um, briefly introduce how it is that I know the information I'm about to give to you, and that is Jewish Family Service is one of two agencies in San Diego, California, um, offering services, direct services to those affected by the MPP program. The program was launched in San Diego, sorry, well, in Tijuana at the San Ysidro Port of Entry. It expanded then um, slowly after that across the border. Um, so uh, it, it started in January 2019. We started representing cases directly in March 2019. So far to date, we have uh, retained 33 cases uh, that are enrolled in the MPP program. 17 of those cases, uh, we've assisted in helping them be released into the United States. Um, we also have, we were fortunate to be able to um, list a phone number, a, a WhatsApp number for people to call right before it was published with the um, legal services provider list that they give out to everyone as soon as they're enrolled into removal proceedings. So we've been able to, through that number, provide direct consultations to over 350 people. So through that, we've been able to find out a lot about what's going on um, on the ground in Tijuana. Um, but I think that the focus today is more on what's happening in, San, in the San Diego court. So I'm going to focus what I talk about in, um, on what's happening in the San Diego court. So as is similar with most of the um, immigration courts across the US, it depends on what judge you have that will determine how your case is going to go. And so that is very similar to the MPP program. Um, with San Diego courts, we have some judges that are granting bonds to those who are enrolled in the MPP program now. Uh, that is counterintuitive, right? Because the San Diego Immigration Court is a non-detained docket. It's a non-detained court. So how are folks that are in the Remain in Mexico program being granted bonds when they are in a non-detained court, right? So the, that question is always asked. But the uh, reason is because there's uh, regulations that say that anybody who's enrolled in MPP is detained under the regulations. So we've been able to use that as well as existing law that provides for somebody who is a enter into the United States, um, an EWI enter, to request for a bond hearing. So right now we have uh, one judge who regularly grants bond hearings and bonds. We have um, one judge who just granted his first bond hearing and bond uh, this week. And then we have two other judges who have granted bond hearings. Um, again, this is in the non-detained court that um, have granted bond hearings, but not yet granted a bond. So then the issue is, does ICE release someone into the United States after they are granted a bond uh, directly out of the MPP program? So in order to do that, you have to rush over to ICE. You have to 
be very um, insistent that you can pay the bond and they can be released into the United States after paying that bond. So there is litigation right now going up into the uh, Board of Immigration Appeals regarding whether or not those bonds are um, relevant or not. Um, we are on every case that we have, we are of course requesting bond hearings. Another interesting thing uh, that happens um, individual, based on the judge is whether or not the judge instigates a fear of return to Mexico interview. So everyone who is enrolled in the MPP program has a right to have an interview with an asylum officer regarding their fear of return to Mexico. Now, they have to initiate that by an affirmative statement to a US officer. Now, in practice, we know those on the ground that it doesn't matter if they tell a US officer that they have a fear of return to Mexico, they won't necessarily be scheduled for that fear of return interview. What actually happens is they want them to express that to the judge. And then the government attorney at that point will schedule that person for a fear of return interview. At least this is what's happening in San Diego. Um, so because of that, if someone doesn't feel comfortable expressing their fear of return to Mexico on record before the judge, then they may not ever be scheduled for a fear of return interview. So in San Diego, there are a few judges who have started asking that question or sort of posing um, some questions that lead someone to express a fear of return to Mexico on record in their case. And then after that, the government attorney will put a red sheet on their file and then they will be scheduled for a fear of return interview with an as asylum officer. Um, some judges don't inquire. And so that's why we began a Know Your Rights program in San Diego about a month ago where we are going into the courtrooms and presenting a Know Your Rights presentation to those that are in the MPP program in San Diego and um, helping them understand that they can express a fear of return on record to a judge. Um, so in some cases that's been successful and that's been a way that they can get that fear of return interview. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to make note of uh, in the San Diego court that we're seeing specifically that is um, something that I think you all should know is that there are some cases that are enrolled in the MPP program that by the guidance, the government guidance itself should not be in the program. This would be unaccompanied minors or those with health conditions or um, those who are um, ha have a status in Mexico or are Mexican citizens or I mean there's a whole list. The one thing that we've been able to do in San Diego is flag some of those cases to the judges and some judges well sorry one judge has granted conditional parole to someone who was enrolled in the program that shouldn't have been that was an unaccompanied minor case. Uh, we've been currently litigating some cases who we believe shouldn't be a part of the program because of mental health issues or other major medical issues and we have yet to get traction from a judge to order their release based on that solely um, but that is an issue that we face here in san diego um, as well as of course advocating with the agencies to try to get those people out of the program in any other way that we can so um, i feel like that's uh, my time is up. I think that's about six minutes. So I'm going to leave my time for um, anybody else who wants to uh, or for to give their um, introductions to their jurisdiction, then I can answer questions later. Great. So Taylor, do you mind following up um, with the El Paso Juarez experience? Yeah, hi. Um, so after after MPP started in San Diego and we were able to learn a lot from from Leah and from other partners out there in California, it was next implemented in El Paso. So it started in El Paso around the end of, of March uh, 2018. I think it was around March 27th when they started sending people back at first. And then we had court starting in, in the middle of April. So San Diego and El Paso are the two only places where the courts are happening in the actual courtrooms as opposed to in the tent courts that we'll talk about elsewhere on the border. So they're using our non-detained court as well. Um, what we've seen is that means that most normal non-detained cases have all been bumped from the dockets. Um, not 100% of them, but a large number of them. People have gotten reset notices saying that all the normal non-detained cases have been moved to 2020. Or also I have two cases where they were moved to to be determined, uh, which is, theoretically already been ruled something that should not happen under parade under the Supreme Court. And I have two hearing notices that specifically say TBD. Um, 
Remain in Mexico has been implemented the fastest in El Paso, MPP, um, despite being first in San Diego um, and Tijuana and Mexicali. Um, we have over 18,000 people in the program right now who've been sent back to the El Paso Juarez um, area. That includes the Del Rio sector, which is another um, sector, pretty rural, um, going east of El Paso sector. And we have two non-detained judges who are hearing the cases. It was four, but one of the judges was already scheduled for retirement and another judge retired shortly after MPP started unexpectedly and seemed to indicate that the reasonings why were because of MPP. Um, it's a totally ridiculous system for various reasons. We were able to do a Know Your Rights presentations and friend of court for several months from April through June. We did that with you know, dozens and dozens of people, probably hundreds of people. And then it was, the program was eliminated in June of 2019 because allegedly we weren't allowed to be part of it anymore as third parties. So I know that Leah has done really great work in California. We have not been able to restart. Instead, we've had constant constant issues being pushed out. Um, I've been yelled at personally for smiling at the MPP respondents because they're not my clients. And we're only allowed to speak to people who are our clients but I know lots of folks from Juarez. And so when I see their kids, I get excited. I'm like, oh, no, no. And I've been yelled at and told that I could be physically removed from the courthouse for trying to speak to them or smiling at them outside of what we're allowed to do. Um, what we're also seeing is incredibly packed dockets. So people will show up for court and they won't even see the judge because the docket sometimes have 150 people listed on them and the courtroom the physical courtroom itself can only fit about 40 people at a time so to try and go through all 150 is impossible in the timeline that's given um courts i've, I've stayed for mpp court past 8 p.m this court's going on so long and the respondents themselves the clients they have to show up at the bridge at four in the morning so they show up at the bridge at four in the morning in this incredibly dangerous city what is is really horrific right now. An attorney colleague of mine yesterday was standing outside of the bridge, downtown main bridge, waiting for her client when there was a, a shooting in broad daylight um, and she watched somebody, um, you know, a shooting, et cetera, right there in broad daylight around 9 a.m. while I was in immigration court. Courts are starting hours and hours late. Um, what we're seeing is just absolute desperation. There's lots of great work being done by clinic, also by HIAS. They're both two organizations that are accepting volunteers in, in Juarez, and also by Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center, who's also taking on volunteers. However, like I say, when I say there's 18,000 people, almost everyone does not have an attorney. Um, we're doing as much as possible to educate folks. Um, our judges have given zero bonds. We've had no hope with that whatsoever. The only way we've been able to get people out of the program is by proving severe mental health issues, severe physical health issues, and also sometimes GLBT and some pregnant people. We've had more luck in El Paso with pregnant people than the whole rest of the border. Um, but we had, my colleagues had a fully deaf woman um, who was deaf, didn't know any, um, any written Spanish, any written English, et cetera. And she was returned after 50 some days in CBP holding. She was returned to the streets of Juarez, not taken to a shelter. There's, there's 18,000 people have been returned. The shelters fit maybe max 1,500. And her family actually thought she was dead for several weeks. They, the way they found her is they actually, one of the brothers flew to Juarez and walked the streets of Juarez for, for several days just asking random people in this in the downtown area had they seen a deaf woman um so those types of cases we're seeing i've represented three families which are family separation cases biological parents taken away from their biological children children put into foster care the parents sent back um, to mexico seeing that constantly and just really extreme amounts of violence um kidnappings are so constant that it is almost like commonplace, it's hard to even talk about because it's so constant. We, we're getting calls. I usually get about two calls per week about a kidnapped family in the Juarez area and with from the family members in the US who are being extorted from their lawyers, usually find me on Facebook or whatever and contact me. And it's just, it's constant. It's very frightening for us as attorneys as well. Um, and there's a lot of kind of back and forth on should we keep doing this work? What kind of kidnapping insurance should we have? Um, am I you know, violating my obligations to my own family and to my own children by choosing to do this work. I have got a call recently about 
two young women who were kidnapped already paid the extortions were released and are now in a shelter in Juarez and the kidnappers keep driving by the shelter, um, pointing at them, et cetera. And they want me to go physically drive them from the shelter to the bridge to try and ask to get them out of the program. And, you know, trying to make those decisions of if this is a safe choice or not, especially when to get them out of MPP will be nearly impossible. But we see we've had many kidnapped people get returned to Mexico even after their kidnappings. So is that a risk I want to take when I know there's maybe a 5% chance that they'll be able to pass their non refoulement interview, their fear in Mexico interview? Is this something that I want to take on? And so I'll close up with that, but I just say that there's, there's not, it's too difficult and there's not enough attorneys willing to work on these cases and we'd love more volunteers. So thank you. And uh, we'll go to Laura Tool next. Laura, I'm realizing I'm looking at the poll responses and they really are helpful because I'm seeing that um, quite a few people have had no contact with this program um, before today's webinar or maybe just some basic information that they've read in the press. Um, and even those who have had contact haven't um, been involved in direct representation, which you and, and the volunteers uh, or the, the attorneys at, at Jones Day who are doing this pro bono have. So it might be helpful um, to, in addition to general comments about what it's looking like in Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, to just very briefly lay out sort of what it would have looked like before for a Central American asylum seeker who came to the Laredo border and either presented at the bridge or crossed the river versus what it looks like now kind of from that moment of, of contact with immigration officials. I don't, I, I, I feel safe asking you this because I, I know you even better than the other advocates, but feel free to, to pop it back to somebody else if, if you prefer. No, I got it. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Denise. Um, so in Laredo, as in most of these areas, um, before MPP started, um, if you were an asylum seeker or otherwise seeking some type of uh, similar relief, you could enter the United States one of two ways. You could come to the bridge and say, I'm in, I'm in fear um, of returning to my home country, or you could sneak across the river, which we call enter without inspection, and you might be apprehended. In either instance, if you're apprehended or if you present at the bridge, you are brought into custody for Customs and Border Patrol. Um, you would go through some kind of preliminary screening, and then if you uh, passed some level of screening there, you would go for what we called a credible fear interview by the asylum office. Um, if you passed that, you would get a notice to appear in court. Um, during that whole process, you're probably detained, um, but once you pass your credible fear interview, in many instances, you're released um, from detention and you can go to live with your relatives or friends in the United States um, and pursue your case outside of detention. Some people stayed in detention and pursued their cases in detention. So that's what it used to look like. <clears throat> um, after MPP, um, virtually everybody who is seeking relief under asylum or related similar statutes um, is subject to the migrant protection protocol. So if they enter without inspection, they sneak across the river and they're apprehended, um, or if they present themselves at a port of entry, um, in either instance, they're processed by CBP still, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, but at the end of that processing, they're not given a credible fear interview, but they are given a notice to appear in court in the United States, and then they're sent back to Mexico. So they're literally turned around and they go back across the bridge into Mexico and they wait for a defined period of time when they are allowed to present back on the bridge um, to enter the United States purely and solely for the purposes of attending their hearing. Um, and so for us in Laredo, um, the, the, we're the um, tent court facility, so or one of them. Uh, and so the government set up and built a temporary tent facility um, right next to the port of entry. Um, so when people uh, come back for their date to re-enter the United States, um, as I think Taylor referenced, they have to be, in a, they have to be at the bridge at 4.30 in the morning, um, and they uh, wait, and then they cross the bridge at 4.30. They walk under a covered walkway into a large tent. Um, in that tent, they're processed by Border Patrol. Um, they then go into a separate tent where they wait. Um, the lawyers go into a tent on the other side of the facility where we're processed. Um, and then there are hard-sided containers, larger ones for the master calendar hearings. There are four of those. And then there are about 14 smaller ones uh, that look kind of like shipping containers or like the pods that you might see outside of someone's house when they're moving. That's about the size of them. They have a capacity, max capacity of six people. Um, and so if you have a family of five or a family of six, we're struggling with how a lawyer and a translator can meet with the clients uh, in the, those small um, containers. 
Um, those containers are also the containers where the master, where the merits um, hearings will be. So the master calendar hearings are in the really large temp facilities, but the are um, uh, hard sided facilities. But the merits are in these small kind of shipping container uh, facilities, and so we're struggling with space constraints. Um, they also do the attorney meeting rooms in those spaces, and they do the non-refoulement interviews in those spaces. So that's kind of an overview of sort of what it looks like before and what it looks like now. Is that good, Denise? That's very helpful. Okay. Okay, so um, in Laredo, we have judges by video. So, so far, most of our judges, or all of our judges so far, have been in San Antonio. Um, the judges have flagged for us that there is a definite likelihood that, um, that there will be other judges from across the country who will start to be taking up some of the dockets. Um, but for now, we've had judges um, from San Antonio. Um, the, uh, there are no observers permitted in the tent courts. Um, so um, you are allowed in if you uh, have a client who is present that day, who showed up for court, who's present, then lawyers are permitted with translator uh, to go into the attorney meeting space to meet with your client if you'd like, and then to go into the courtroom to represent your client, but there are no observers permitted there. Um, but observers are permitted in San Antonio, so you can be in the space where the judge and the um, government attorney are, but you can't be in the space where the um, migrants are for their proceedings. Um, Nuevo Laredo is a little bit unique, although not entirely so. Um, Nuevo Laredo is incredibly dangerous, um, as we've heard from the other border towns. Um, we've made an assessment that for Nuevo Laredo, uh, we're not going in at all to Nuevo Laredo. Uh, we made a couple of exploratory visits and um, decided that we could no longer uh, operate in Nuevo Laredo. Uh, so we do all of our work by phone. So some of our clients are in Nuevo Laredo and hiding um, in different churches and basements, living on roofs and such. Um, but they are also moving all over the place because Nuevo Laredo is such a difficult city. Um, they're in Monterey, they're in Mexico City, uh, they're in other border towns along uh, the border down toward the valley. Um, so our clients aren't in kind of a central location. So going to a place to meet with a group of our clients is really challenging because our clients um, for the Laredo courts are sort of all over the place. Um, so uh, I, similar to Taylor, we've had a, um, uh, a lot of instances of persecution and, and uh, uh, trauma for our clients in Mexico, high percentages of reports of kidnapping, violence, rape, other assaults. Um, there are uh, lots of families with little children. They're struggling to find places to live. Uh, to find food to eat. Uh, we've had family members that have just disappeared. Um, we don't know what's happened to them. Um, and so the challenge, the situation is super difficult for them um, there. Uh, right now, we're the only organized legal service provider. Uh, we're a law firm, so we're not actually a legal service provider. We're the only organization providing uh, free legal services consistently at the border. I know some other lawyers are showing up uh, in San Antonio and a couple of others have been to the tent courts. Um, we would love some additional help in Laredo. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, and so then if we can continue on down the border and ask uh, Laura Pena to speak about what's happening in the Brownsville, Matamoros area. Sure, thanks, Denise. Uh, they saved the best for last here in Brownsville. Uh, MPP started, unfortunately, in July 19th, and uh, the courts started accepting and, uh, individuals through the program and master calendar hearings September 26th. Uh, before going into the courts, because it seems like there's a number of individuals on the call uh, who may not have that much familiarity with MPP, I did just want to point out one of the major reasons why the entire program is illegal is because it violates our international obligations under the law. So the United States is a party to the 1967 protocols uh, relating to the status of refugees and the Convention Against Torture. And both of those uh, prevent the United States from sending individuals back to uh, places where they will be in danger. For the protocols, it, I'll just read the language, uh, the United States shall not expel or return a refugee in any manner whatsoever to the frontiers of territories where his or her freedom would be threatened on account of his race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Uh, the danger that Taylor and Laura were describing, uh, these folks are under, under threat uh, 
particularly because they are seeking protection in the United States. Uh, even more broadly, the Convention Against Torture prevents the United States from returning individuals to another state where there are substantial grounds for believing that he would be in danger of being subde subjected to torture. There have been disappearances, uh, and, and they're, they're, they're reported. Uh, you know, uh, Human Rights First has uh, a count of the number of kidnappings and disappearances, assaults, rapes that are occurring in Mexico as a result uh, of this program. So those, that's just one of the major reasons under the law why MPP is illegal. Uh, in terms of Brownsville, uh, the court, and in your notes, actually, we were able to get a, a tour of the facility before it opened. Uh, so you can read a little more specific specifics if you want to see what the what the facility looks like. Uh, those are in your notes and available in the handout section. Uh, but there's six master calendar hearing rooms, 60 merit hearing rooms, and 60, that's six zero, attorney client privilege rooms. Uh, there are five waiting areas, uh, one waiting room for attorneys and witnesses, and two rooms for individuals who are what they deem to be non-compliant. Oh, so individuals who they uh, believe uh, now have criminal history because individuals with criminal history are not supposed to be uh, subjected to remain in Mexico. In terms of the court process, uh, for the first couple of months, there's five dockets a day, which is uh, extremely challenging. One's at 8, 8.30, 9, 1, and 3 p.m. Uh, so that'll be for the first couple of months. So hopefully come November, uh, we will have a, a regular court docket, which would be um, uh, 8.30 and then 1 p.m. Uh, similar to the tent courts in Laredo, hearings are all live via tele, tele, uh, te excuse me, video teleconferencing. Uh, the judge and the trial attorney and the interpreter are all in uh, other courts and they're video conferenced into the tent facility. Uh, the respondents and the respondents' attorneys uh, are in the temp facilities. Uh, there's ICE contractors who help manage and serve as quasi clerks uh, for the attorneys and respondents in, in the court. Uh, non refoulement interviews, uh, the international obligations I was mentioning before, that's the obligation to not return. It's the Spanish, the French word, you know, refoulement. Uh, under this rule, they have created this concept of a non refoulement interview. Uh, the standard is very high. It's uh, greater, it's more than 51%, which is harder. It's a higher standard than actually asylum. And individuals have to establish uh, that they have a fear of returning to Mexico and it has to be meet an extremely high standard. Uh, the interviews are conducted by asylum officers, uh, either in the tent facility or remotely. Uh, so far, no bond uh, grants, at least not down here in Brownsville. Um, I know we probably want to get to questions soon. I just want to talk a little bit about the efforts in the Rio Grande Valley. And I have to give a shout out uh, to our local uh, attorney and uh, hero. Uh, Jody Goodwin has led a phenomenal effort uh, and ProBar uh, has been supporting her to the best that we can. Uh, currently in a volunteer capacity, but we are a switching paths and we will be formally uh, taking clients uh, who are subjected to MPP uh, as soon as we expand our staff and we will be uh, opening up an office in Brownsville as well. Uh, Lawyers for Good Government is also partnering uh, with Jody and the volunteer efforts down here. Uh, their project, Project Corazon, uh, they have a schedule of bringing in Spanish-speaking immigration attorneys. I believe it's every other weekend. And what they're doing is having asylum workshops. Uh, these are, they have the workshops in Matamoros. Uh, so it's sort of a, a, an extreme environment, I would say. Uh, it's all day in the hot sun uh, on the plaza, just the other side of the, just on the other side of the bridge. Uh, and those asylum workshops result in draft I-589s. So Project Corazon has been asking for lawyers to remotely, especially lawyers who speak Spanish, to remotely translate and, uh, and put the data into English language asylum applications. So for anybody with familiarity uh, with I-589s, which is the asylum application, volunteers are needed through uh, Lawyers for Good Government. Um, 
I will say, I, I just want to end with, for those folks who uh, have some experience in the immigration realm, uh, we are opening an office in Brownsville, even though ProBar is, is located in Harlingen, which is, which is nearby. So we are looking to hire a senior attorney and a paralegal. Uh, so if any of you are interested in rolling up your sleeves uh, and getting into some of these really critical issues and providing services to a very, very vulnerable population, uh, we'd welcome you, uh, your applications. Thanks, Denise. Thanks to all of you. That was incredibly informative. Um, so I'm going to ask some guided questions, some of which will be based off of audience questions. And then uh, please do continue to, to send in your, your questions uh, so that we can talk about those. Um, Patricia, a, a technical question and then a access to counsel question. Since um, this is a, an ABA call, I think people will be very interested in understanding a little bit more of the contours of what access to counsel looks like. The technical question is uh, for people who are in Mexicali um, through the Remain in Mexico program, um, are their hearings also being heard along with those who are in Tijuana um, in the San Diego court? And then also for people who are in the San Diego court through the Remain in Mexico program, what does it look like exactly on the day that they appear for court in the sense of, since it's a non-detained court, sort of how did they get from the bridge to the court? What does that look like? And actually, Taylor, you might uh, want to answer that for El Paso as well. Um, but then if you could also speak to what access to counsel looks like. Um, and I think there are really two sides of that. One is access to counsel sort of in the court context when people appear for their hearings uh, in the US. Uh, but then the second aspect of that is to what extent do, do people uh, living in Northern Baja California while in this program have access to counsel? Are there attorneys who are uh, working with people on the Mexico side in that region? Patricia, you want to touch that? And Leah, if you have any to follow on. Sure. So actually, um, our involvement is more with people that are, have been expressed, have expressed a fear of return and have actually been placed in detention. So um, that's when we get in contact with those clients um, that were formerly part of MVP but are now in detention. So I would actually defer to Leah um, on this question because she is, um, you know, on the ground and in the courts. Great, and then we'll come back and ask you about how you got them out of MPP. <laughs> but Leah, do you wanna respond to the Yeah, so in San Diego, um, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm green. Um, in San Diego, we don't have 10 courts, so we also have dockets at 4.30 in the morning and uh, 12.30 in the afternoon. Sorry, 8.30 and 12.30 in the afternoon, people have to present at the port of entry at 4.30 in the morning and um, at 9 a.m. in the morning for those hearings. They appear at the port of entry and then they are transported by ICE um, contract officers to the court. Once they arrive at court, then they are um, put into each of the respective courtrooms. Every courtroom at this moment in time is um, is live. There are no dark courtrooms. The officers guard everybody while they're in the courtroom. So there are officers in uniform uh, with SWAT. It looks like SWAT gear and they have a big detention officer on the back of their uniform and they guard them um, while they're in the court. I know somebody else I think it was Taylor mentioned that you're not allowed to enter in the courtroom and talk to anybody while they're uh, waiting for their hearing here. The officers, at least for Jewish Family Services, they've allowed us to enter into the courtroom and talk to anybody who's in the courtroom while they wait for their hearing. Um, that wasn't the case from January to, um, I would say, June. But then after June, they started allowing us into the courtroom as soon as everybody's transported into the courtroom. As far as access to counsel, you do have time to meet with your clients before the court hearings. You can go into the courtroom itself um, and meet with your clients, but the, there's no privacy. You are meeting in a courtroom that is packed with people. There are children sleeping on the floor. There are um, children running around. There are children crying, and you are generally standing up because it's standing room only unless you are a respondent and trying to fill out forms and talk with your clients. Um, and then after the court hearing, as soon as everyone is done with their 
and a uh, court hearing, uh, if it's a master, then they are escorted out of the courtroom immediately after after and taken into a room that we have no access to. So you only have access to your clients immediately before the hearing. And um, and then as accessing clients in Tijuana, Tijuana is also a very dangerous border region. We are seeing many of the same things that the other uh, presenters said regarding the dangers that they are suffering in, in Tijuana. Um, I, I would say that it, it sounds pretty bad across the border all around. Um, and I don't know if I've answered all of your questions. Your question was kind of long. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to get out both the technical aspects. But so it, it, just a, a really small thing, Mexicali folks are in the San yes. Diego court as well, correct? Um, yeah, and an interesting thing to note is people are presenting all the way in Texas and then they're processed in Texas, and then they're flown to Tijuana and released in Tijuana. And then they are presenting in Mexicali, they are presenting in Otay Mesa, they are presenting in um, in uh, the San Ysidro Port of Entry, and they are, present and, and they are entering, UE enters, uh, entered without inspection all the way from here to Texas. And those folks are all sent and uh, released into Tijuana. They're flown there, released in Tijuana, and scheduled for San Diego non-detained, quote unquote, non-detained court. So, okay. Um, and in terms of access to counsel, in the sense of the ability of legal services providers to meet with clients while they are in Mexico, given the limitations of the short period uh, for meeting with clients, right? prior to a hearing, is that happening? And, and what uh, what are the strengths and, and weaknesses of that model? So uh, similar to the other areas, we, we do not have enough service providers here offering services. Uh, Tijuana does fortunately have El Trilado. They are the only organization on the ground right now operating, um, doing um, Pre uh, both know your rights presentations as well as pro se preparations, but that's in uh, Tijuana specifically. They are starting to have, um, I think, monthly, bi-monthly transports to Mexicali where they do presentations there and do pro se workshops as well. Um, as far as locations and places to meet your clients in Tijuana and Mexicali, that those don't exist unless you have relationships already. Um, it is either you are going to your client's apartment to meet with them, or you are, um, we have formed some relationships with some of the shelters, the migrant shelters in Tijuana, and they've allowed us to meet with clients that aren't even um, there at the shelter. Uh, they've offered their facilities for us to meet with clients there. Most of our work is done over the phone. Um, I know that in, Immigrant Defenders and HIAS have been working together as well with us and UNHCR and other organizations to start um, building more programs uh, on the south side of the border, but I know that they've been uh, up against obstacles as well as far as finding a secure location, a place that's safe, a place that people can access meaning there's either public transportation or they feel safe traveling to that location. Um, but right now, nothing exists in Tijuana. And again, this is the first location where this program began. So that means it's been operational here for almost a year. And still in Tijuana, we don't have structures set up for regular support systems for those who are affected by this program. And, and following up on that, um, Laura, Laura Toole, um, you already indicated that the, the firm has decided that it isn't feasible or, or safe to have attorneys crossing uh, to provide representation uh, or meetings directly in Mexico. So how, what model are you using and is that changing or developing as you get closer to a point where you will have actual merits hearings, mini asylum trials? Yeah, so we have done our work thus far uh, by phone. Uh, so we have a series of burner phones uh, to avoid uh, our volunteers getting calls from the cartel on their personal cell phones uh, when and if our clients are kidnapped. Uh, so we have a series of burner phones in Laredo and we have teams that fly in to Laredo and work there and we communicate with our clients by cell phone, sometimes by video chat. So if they're on WhatsApp, you can do video chatting with them. Uh, so we've done a fair amount of that. We've created an app that we use to collect I-589 information so that we don't have to do all of that by phone. So we can send them a link. They fill out a lot of the biographical information. They send it back to us and we can at least get 
that process started. So we're working on some technological solutions to being able to communicate with them when we can't meet with them in person. Um, we are, our first uh, merit is a week from Friday. Um, and we already have about 10 set up between now and Thanksgiving. Um, and so we're really going to see the crunch coming up about how to prepare our clients for trial um, and do the type of in-depth interviewing that we would normally do in person for many hours uh, to figure out how we do that by phone and what the obstacles and the challenges are. Um, but right now, that's largely our best um, option. Uh, there, a couple of our clients are in Monterey, and so we may be able to go to Monterey. We have a relationship with a shelter there. Um, and so even though our clients aren't staying there, we can use their space. And so we do have some options um, in Monterey, but for the rest of our clients in Nuevo Laredo, there's no other option than by phone. We do um, get to meet with them before and after the hearings. So we do have about 30 minutes before their master calendar hearing and about 30 to 45 minutes after. Um, we've really only been able, I mean, that time is largely for signing documents, you know, the engagement letter, getting signature pages for things, explaining to them what's going to happen at the hearing, explaining to them what happened at the hearing, um, so that you can't really do the kind of in-depth relationship building that you would want to do in person, but we have at least been able to have some personal contact with them um, when they've attended their preliminary hearing. And Patricia, I do want to follow up on the successes that you all have had getting some people out of the program. And Leah also mentioned the, the bond possibility. Would you mind explaining that a bit more and, and letting us know if there are other strategies that have worked in getting people out of the program? In other words, allowing them to pursue their asylum claims from within the United States? Sure. So Leah, do you want to start with getting them out and then I can follow up when they are detained? Um, yeah, so um, a lot of our clients, have, we've gotten out of the program through just straight advocacy. So it's a, a balance between putting the right things on the court record and then submitting parole requests or just straight up um, communication directly with officers. Um, some of our clients have had positive non-refoulement interviews. Sorry, I'm probably not saying that correctly. Um, so they've been post then released into the United States. We have a client who was a federal defender case, meaning she was enrolled in MPP and then she was, she was separated from her younger sibling. They were both uh, very young, but she was just over the age of 18. So um, she was enrolled in MPP and then her younger sibling was separated from her. She um, then tried to re-enter later on after already being at, uh, enrolled in the MPP program and of course then was uh, criminally prosecuted for misdemeanor re-entry. Um, the federal defenders referred her case to us. She was um, then after that detained at the OMDC, Otay Mesa Detention Center, and um, they then released her from the program uh, per some of our um, advocacy for her. So there's also a judge who granted conditional parole for somebody who was an unaccompanied minor. I mentioned that earlier, and we're arguing for conditional parole for others who shouldn't be amenable to the program at all as well. Um, but that's after we've already done every type of um, advocacy we can with the agencies, with DHS, with, um, um, and then also they aren't passing the non-refoulement interviews as well as people don't want to always have a non-refoulement interview because they're afraid of being in detention. So sometimes they refuse those interviews because of the conditions of detention. Uh, because if you were an iwi enterer, then um, when you go for a non-refoulement interview, then you are processed by the agency that initially processed you. So you were sent back to Border Patrol conditions in the condition where in the uh, place where you were initially apprehended, and those conditions are generally pretty awful. You might be detained for two or three days uh, before you have an interview. Um, some, a lot of people are uh, released from the program for other various reasons, um, like they've won their case or they've been denied relief. And then after that, they reserve appeal. And then if it's an individual, then they are sent to a detention center. If it's a family, they might be sent to a family detention center or released into the United States. So that's how um, I believe that Patty and IJP have come across a lot of those um, cases because they are then detained. It's either after it's either post grant relief or they passed a fear interview and then they are um, determined to be detained and not released into the United States. Yeah, and so that's where um, we've seen the majority of people that were formerly an MPP. And so some of the issues that we've come across is, um, and I just want to talk, you know, very basics, people who are and are not eligible for bonds, someone who is an arriving alien, so they present at the port of entry, 
is not eligible for a bond, whereas someone that is found within the United States is eligible for a bond. Um, the issue with MPP is that they're designating um, mostly everyone in MPP as an arriving alien, um, meaning that the people that we encounter at the detention center um, that were, um, even if they were found within the United States, um, are uh, designated arriving aliens and therefore when they go and try to get a bond from a judge where you would be eligible for a bond the judges are saying no because they're designated as arriving aliens um the cases that we've come across and recently i had um three siblings who all were found within the united states they attempted to get a bond hearing but the judge said they could not get a bond because they were um designated as arriving aliens um we took their case and um, we successfully argued before um, a different judge that they were improperly designated as arriving aliens um, because they were found within the United States and should be eligible for bond. Um, the government tried to argue that because they presented at the port of entry to go to their court, they were therefore applicants for admission at that moment. Um, we argued that um, their proceedings began before that and that they were found within the United States and that's when their proceedings began. Um, the judge was very open to that argument and she also um, questioned whether our clients um, were forced into the MPP program or whether it was their choice to be part of the MPP program and of course it wasn't. And so after that, um, the judge granted bond and so the clients have been released. Um, the good thing with that is that they were represented. The issue comes where people are not represented and they're calling for bond hearings and are being told they can't even schedule the bond hearing because they're found, they're arriving aliens. Um, we just recently got a case, um, a similar case. I've tried to call and schedule a bond hearing and um, the clerks are telling me that I can't schedule a bond hearing. Um, so um, it's, it's one of those, it's a constant uh, um, you know, struggle trying to even get a bond hearing when the judge is the one that should be making a jurisdiction issue, not the clerks. So that, and that's one of the things that, that we're experiencing here at Altai Mesa Detention Center. So even after you get them out of MPP, facing difficulties with ongoing detention in cases where normally they would have had the right to review of, of their detention. Okay. Exactly. Um, Laura, you talked about uh, some of the lawyering efforts that have been taking place on a pro se basis in Matamoros Brownsville. We also have a question from an audience member about what else is being done, can be done, uh, even for non-lawyer uh, volunteers. Um, so perhaps if you could describe sort of the living circumstances of uh, asylum seekers who are returned to Matamoros through Remain in Mexico and what's being done on a kind of humanitarian uh, level um, to support those asylum seekers. Yes, thank you uh, to the person who posed the question and Denise. Uh, Currently in Matamoros, there's approximately 800 refugees living in a tent encampment just across the port of entry. Uh, the health issues are extremely, extremely concerning uh, in addition to the safety and violence issues that were previously mentioned. Uh, there have been outbreaks of chickenpox. Uh, lice uh, is, a, is a big problem. So those types of I, honestly, lice kits are, are needed right now. Uh, the organization, a nonprofit organization called Team Brownsville, uh, came, it was a, just a group of three to five individuals uh, here in Brownsville, uh, former teachers who got together and decided to begin uh, feeding the refugees who were waiting uh, pursuant to the metering policy, which we haven't talked about, but pre-MPP and still today, their individuals were turned away at the port of entry. Um, and they continue to be turned away. Um, so this organization is teambrownsville.org. They accept donations and they are providing meals, a breakfast and dinner every day uh, for the asylum seekers waiting in Matamoros. So that's six to 800 meals twice a day that they are providing to these individuals who are in need. Uh, so you can go to their website, you can volunteer with them. Uh, they have, because they've gotten quite a bit of publicity, they have a lot of volunteers, so I'd encourage you, uh, just don't come down, but make sure that you you notify them of when you want to come down and volunteer. And there's other organizations as well. Uh, Angry uh, Tias y Abuelas is uh, down here in the Rio Grande Valley. We haven't talked about Reynosa, 
which is another large city, uh, also a dangerous city, but there's more volunteers in that area. And the Angry Dias and Abuelas, they received actually a, an award from the from the Kennedy Human Rights Center uh, for their work, and they provide assistance also to the asylum seekers waiting. Uh, the lawyers, we try and partner up with them to the extent we can. It's helpful for lawyers to, to be with other volunteers at the same time, you know, safety in numbers. Uh, let's see, we're all women on this call presenters, which is awesome, but we're, we're used to that. And so we try and go in groups, which actually, you know, makes it um, a little more enjoyable, to be honest. You know, there's a lot of advocates, uh, and that is one, if there is any silver lining on all of this, the local communities really have stood up in support uh, of their communities on both sides of the border. We don't see a border here. We know that it's a focal point in national discourse. But for us, it doesn't exist. These are our people. And you know, I grew up down here. And so it's great to see that we're co coming together and we welcome people from all over the country to come and witness for yourself. Denise, can I answer, add something to that as well? That would be I great. And I have a follow-up question for you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I just wanted to say one of the things that I've been pushing really hard is immigration attorneys from across the country being willing to take these cases even paid. Um, if you can afford to do pro bono work, that's totally understandable. We all have bills to pay. And so I think that trying to encourage, even if you just take one case. So for me, I think there's really amazing volunteer programs that exist. You can come with the Project Corazon, you can come with Hives, you can come with Clinic for a weekend or a week. But you could also just take on one single asylum removal defense case from start to finish and take it on that case, even if you have to charge the family or, or different groups, church groups or nonprofits who could maybe fundraise to pay you something to take that case would be really wonderful because we need more attorneys taking these cases. Um, all the volunteer projects are wonderful. The work that um, you know, Jones Day is doing is absolutely phenomenal that Jody Goodwin's doing the work that I'm trying to do pro bono. I mean, we're we're all killing ourselves, but we're talking 50,000 plus people. And I am constantly speaking to respondents here in Juarez who have money and they want to hire someone and no one will touch these cases. And I understand why Mexico is dangerous. It's a pain in the ass. The court courts are annoying. But if we could get more attorneys in the rest of the country to take this on as it's not just a border problem, you know, it's a it's part of our community. We have an obligation to serve these folks. That would be really, really helpful. Denise, so, before you ask her one more question, sorry, I just want to jump in on that, Taylor. Uh, yeah, you you know, the access and the due process question that you asked earlier. Also, Denise, one thing that we are trying to do at the ABA and the president of the ABA, Judy Perry Martinez, this is a, a a, a big concern for her and the ABA as well is for the tent facilities, at least in Laredo and Brownsville. I mentioned there are 60 attorney client privilege rooms. Taxpayers paid millions of dollars for these monstrosities where there are no lawyers on the US side of the border. So, and we have, we do have a pending motion with an immigration judge for increased access to our clients at these tent facilities. So to the extent the ABA and others are successful in getting more uh, actual, uh, meaningful uh, attorney client access within these temp facilities, that will also, we're hoping and to encourage attorneys to take these cases because they will be able to meet their clients you know, more than four hours before their hearing date. So that's something that we are also working on. Great. So Taylor, just because uh, you're in an area where at least so far we've seen the largest number of cases, as I understand it, and the program has been going since March, um, you might have some insights into some of the basic uh, sort of statistics of this. Um, what is the rate of representation? Um, what is the rate of in absentia deportation orders where people don't appear for their hearings? And if you have any sense of what some of the reasons for in absentia um, orders might be, why people don't appear for their hearings? Yeah, I don't remember the numbers for absentias off the top of my head. I don't know if anyone else does. Do you remember? Because Reuters just did really great statistical analysis of the EOIR statistics, and I don't remember them off the top of my head. I do remember the representation rate, which was nationwide, it was 1.52% have attorneys. Um, the absentia rates, I'm not sure of. What we're seeing in El Paso is a lot of people show up for their first hearing um, anecdotally, because they don't let us, they don't let us even write down the docket. We used to be able to take pictures of the docket, and sometimes now they usually yell at us if we even try and write it down. 
um, but I'm seeing appearance rates usually for first hearings of about about 70 percent generally for first hearings and then it's higher for Cubans because Cubans tend to be a little savvier and a little wealthier sometimes and are more likely to show up for court so Cubans were seeing like 95 percent appearance rates and then it dips after the first hearing um, a lot of the Central Americans in particular don't use the internet as much they don't have as much knowledge and then they don't realize that their first hearing isn't going to be their last hearing a lot of people show up for these they're very short preliminary hearings um you spend all day in court but you actually see the judge for maybe three minutes if you're individual if it's a group hearing for maybe 30 minutes um and they think that that's going to be their asylum hearing and that the judge is going to hear me and he's going to know that i'm telling the truth he's going to hear me corazoncito y todo. and that's not that's very depressing for people after they see that that's not what happens and then they get returned to mexico again um, most of the soldiers don't allow people to come back after their first court hearing because after um, when they're sent back the first time they're supposed to come up with a plan for after the first court hearing so they get sent back they're back on the streets usually and then they don't necessarily come up for their second hearings we're seeing much lower rates um in el paso definitely fewer than one percent of people have attorneys um i don't even think we're at the 1.5 i think that's because of california is pulling the numbers up for folks um, <laughs> And we in El Paso, we yesterday heard of our first win um, in all of El Paso. So I was a, a private attorney, Berta Zuniga, and she won for a Cuban case with a judge yesterday who had a 99.34% denial rate. And she granted an asylum to a Cuban yesterday. So that was a huge, wonderful news. In California, y'all are seeing more wins. And I think we're going to hopefully see, we've seen there was a withholding win this week, I know, out of Brownsville, and we're going to see more and more wins as, as more people get involved. That's great. Um, and Laura, Tool, there was also a, a, a basic demographics question about who is being placed into the Remain in Mexico program. Uh, who's being placed in the program generally? Uh, all yeah. asylum seekers, except for, right, all asylum seekers, uh, people seeking withholding removal and convention against torture relief, except for people that are unaccompanied minors, um, are not supposed to be in the program. Uh, people who are originally from Mexico should not be returned to the country from which they fear. So it should, people from Mexico originally should not be part of the program. And then people with serious um, medical or um, mental health issues should not be part of the, should be allowed to stay in the United States. And then there is this non-refoulement interview process that we've been talking about. So people that can establish um, that they have a protected fear of returning to Mexico, even if Mexico isn't their country of origin, should be removed from the project. We've seen very little, we've seen no success uh, in our project for those types of interviews. There have been a little bit higher rates of success maybe in other um, parts of the border, but um, we've had no success yet um, with any um, non refoulement interviews. So what nationalities, though, just to be concrete, what do you what are you seeing of people who are in the program? And what happens to people who aren't from Latin America at all, who don't speak Spanish or English? We have a, so we have a hotline that people can call to reach us. So I can't say, I can't speak to like who all has been sent back in Laredo. I don't know that. Um, the people that are reaching out to us have been all from Latin America. Um, we haven't had any outreach from anyone that wasn't from, um, from one of the Latin American countries in Cuba. Uh, we, uh, the largest percentage of people that are reaching out to us are Venezuelans and Cubans, um, but we are also getting uh, calls from um, other Central Americans, um, from Central Americans, and then a few, you know, a few other pockets of folks from different places. But the largest group is Cubans and Venezuelans. Do others want to answer that question about what nationalities you're mostly seeing? So it's limited to Spanish speaking countries, um, which is a really ridiculous term because what is a Spanish speaking country? There's native English speaking Hondurans, there's indigenous speakers from Guatemala, but it's limited by country, not by language. So we have seen lots of indigenous speakers. Um, it, it doesn't include Brazilians. El Paso is getting lots of Brazilians. I was just at the, one of the shelters today in El Paso for Annunciation House visiting, and there were something like 150 some Brazilians who were released yesterday, um, for example, because Brazilians are exempt, um, people from African countries are exempt, um, but we do see lots of indigenous Guatemalans being put in. We try and get them out if possible. And then I do think Cubans and Venezuelans and sometimes Nicaraguans as well tend to once again be savvier, are more apt to access services sometimes, but still definitely in Juarez, El Paso, the majority of the people actually put into MPP remain being Central Americans, Hondurans, Guatemalans, um, El Salvador, but a lot of them are choosing choosing to go home um, or to try and settle elsewhere in Mexico because it's just so incredibly dangerous. 
And yeah, that's, that's the thing here as well in San Diego, uh, but predominantly our cases that we see are from the Northern Triangle more than any other country. And I would just say it presents a particular challenge for indigenous speaking individuals. You know, indigenous speakers sometimes can get by with a little bit of Spanish uh, because they've made the journey uh, from their from their communities. Uh, you know, so we see a number of indigenous speakers who are inappropriately, well, it's all inappropriate, <laughs> but against their own policy placed into MPP. And so that's another very vulnerable population that it has even more challenges in terms of navigating the complex system and getting access to a due process. So several of you have mentioned that we're starting to see results in merits hearings, and there's a question about how long this process is taking. Um, can you answer in your different regions how many master calendar hearings are typical before a final merits asylum full-blown hearing um, generally uh, are, are scheduled? And, and how long is it typically from the moment somebody is first processed by Border Patrol and returned to Mexico mm -hmm. program until they get a final hearing? In other words, how long are they stuck in, in northern Mexico while they're waiting for their hearings and having to go back and forth to the to the border for those hearings? Taylor, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I'm really passionate about that question because it's so ridiculous. At the beginning, things were faster. At the beginning, it was two, three weeks for your first hearing. Um, they were only scheduling for one judge at the beginning, and then they opened up more judges. So there's people who actually crossed earlier, but since there was only one judge, the farthest out I saw is I had a transgender woman who was put into the program. We were able to get her out. She crossed in May, and her first court was March 2020. Um, because she crossed when there was only one judge. Most of what we're seeing if somebody crosses right now in El Paso, their first court hearing is going to be in about three months, usually two to three months. Um, but for the entire month of September in El Paso, there were zero individual hearing dates available for pretty much the entire month of September. So there were multiple people coming in for their master calendar hearings with their I-5 names ready, their asylum applications ready, even with attorneys who could not set for an individual hearing because all the dates had been taken. They were just reset for masters again because all the dates were taken. So as it rolls out along the border and more judges are opened up, you see it faster and faster because this week we got two new judges in El Paso, but via video teleconferencing out of the Fort Worth Adjudication Center and their calendars are empty. So now things are faster again, luckily. Um, but people are completely desperate. All, everyone in September got reset. Almost everyone in September got reset for mid-December. And people were just crying in the courtroom. I mean, for not because it wasn't even reset for an asylum. It was reset for, the judge apologized honestly a lot. But it was reset for, sorry, you all have to come back in December. For another initial master calendar hearing. Uh, what about Brownsville? Very, very similar. It's a moving target. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a six. There's room for 60 merit hearings, and there's six master calendar hearings. So uh, right now we have El Paso and local judges uh, who are uh, teleconferencing it or video conferencing into uh, the Brownsville Port Court. Uh, initially, you could get in and get if you were prepared at the first master calendar hearing. Uh, could get a hearing in October, or November. I have a merits uh, from early October that's set for uh, late November, but now that's being pushed out to January. Uh, as we get uh, more judges assigned to the Brownsville Port Court, I anticipate it will change. And Laura, what about Laredo? Uh, we are seeing some initial mer uh, masters all the way out into 2020, so January, February. Uh, we have just started our, um, you know, we've been in court for about a month. Uh, we're now filing I-589s at the first master calendar and they're setting merits. Uh, so this week we had merits. They offered us uh, two days away. We uh, declined that two days wasn't quite enough time to prepare for um, our merits, uh, but they're scheduling them like three weeks away from their first master to their merits. Before I go to San Diego, what's a 589 and what language does it have to be prepared and submitted in? 
The I-589 is your application for asylum, withholding a protection under uh, the Convention Against Torture, and your application for withholding of removal. Uh, it's a multi-page document that was designed for people who are in the United States. So many of the questions do not actually make sense because they're not designed for people that are in MPP. So you have to make a lot of judgment calls about how to answer the questions because like what's your address in the US? They don't have one because they're not in the US. That's one of the prominent questions at the beginning of the application. Um, and it has to be filled out in English. Um, so, uh, and then they have to file that in order to get a merits hearing date. And what about San Diego? What's the timing looking like? So it's again, judge specific. So we have one judge who will reschedule a merits hearing within the same week uh, for pro se respondents. And then if they're represented, you might be able to get him to push the merits for two weeks out or maybe even three weeks if you really, really beg. And then we have other judges who the way that they uh, schedule their dockets, they focus a lot more on due process concerns and issues. So they uh, focus very a lot of time on removability. So they're rescheduling uh, their initial merits to about a month or two out and then second merits to about a month out. And then the, you might get to a merits in about six or eight months. Um, and that's for pro se uh, and represented folks for those judges. Um, and then there's sort of like a variance between the two extremes for that. Um, I can say right now, presenters who initially presented in July are having their initial master calendar hearing in October uh, in this month. So um, we also, I don't know if you're experiencing this in the other areas, but I am seeing up to eight or nine individual hearings scheduled for one docket. So mm -hmm. meaning they're doing like half hour individual hearing, they're scheduling each individual for a half hour merits hearing. If it's a pro se, if you are represented, then you can of course fight for more time and the judge likely will give it to you. But at pro se merits hearings, they're scheduling as many as they can on one docket. How long does a merits hearing typically take even for a pro se respondent? before the implementation of this program? Um, for a pro se respondent, that's really hard for me to answer because of course, usually if I'm if I'm there, then that it's not pro se. But typically before MPP started, then all merits hearings were scheduled one per docket, right? So if it's a 1 p.m. hearing, then they schedule uh, four hours for that merits only. And so then that afternoon is completely eaten up by one um, here by one case or one family of cases that are all consolidated cases. So now they're cramming in up to eight. Thank you. Um, so several questions were raised and I was planning to raise this in any case about the safe third country transit ban and how it interacts with the Remain in Mexico program. So of course the this ban is a is a separate uh, presidentially initiated uh, regulation. Uh, executive uh, regulation um, that imposes a, a substantive eligibility bar for asylum for individuals who have passed through countries like Mexico that are parties to the UN Refugee Convention and, and related instruments. Um, it, uh, it unless and so the ban exists unless you have applied for and been denied asylum in that country that you transited through. It's, as I say, it's, it's essentially a substantive ban. It, it's, it's different from the Remain in Mexico program in that it doesn't physically or procedurally move somebody around and force them to, to apply for asylum in another country like Mexico. It, it substantively makes them ineligible for asylum in the US if they've been through Mexico and hadn't applied for asylum there. Um, and the Supreme Court has allowed it to go into effect, refusing to um, uphold the injunction. Uh, how does it interact with the Remain in Mexico program? Is it applied to, to people who are in the Remain in Mexico program? Anybody wanna take that one on? Can I take just an initial stab at that? Um, some of the issues that we see with that, uh, we haven't necessarily seen anybody nobody has contacted us for services who has been rejected at the at the border um, but that's because they're just not reaching out so i'm sure that there are folks that come and present for uh because they're afraid to return to their country and then they are just flat out rejected any sort of processing whatsoever 
but the the concerns that we're seeing with an MPP are those who start an MPP before July 16th. So that's the cutoff date. That's when that, that decision that you're talking about takes effect. Um, they hold an MPP before July 16th, meaning they initially presented or were apprehended within the United States before July 16th. Then maybe they can't make it to their first court hearing or their second hearing. And they're either, um, most of the time their cases, are, at least in San Diego, are terminated. Um, that person is still in Mexico, and then they have to represent to initiate their proceedings once again. So that means then they would, at that point in time, be subject to this asylum ban. So that's where the lar largest concern is, at least in San Diego, is we are fighting hard against terminations of cases, because if somebody did present initially before or apprehended before July 16th, then we want to hold tight to that entry date and have them forced into a subsequent entry date. There are also, I think, concerns regarding the government arguing that subsequent entries for the purpose of um, court hearings would subject them to this ban as well. And I haven't seen um, those arguments be put forth yet by the government, but those are concerns that we have. And then I'll let anybody else speak to it. Yeah, in El Paso, one of our judges on his own, um, like to Esponte, is raising the issue, saying that anyone, if their original entry was before July 16th, if they come back in for court and it's after July 16th, that the ban applies. That's been very frustrating because DO, DOJ and DHS announced multiple times to reporters that that was not the interpretation. Um, most recently, I believe one of my colleagues um, Several of my colleagues have been asked to brief it for one of our judges in particular in DHS. The government attorneys just tell us, literally tell us, we don't know, we don't have guidance, or wait for a brief, basically. It's, it's very, very frustrating because they told multiple reporters that it would not be this interpretation. Um, obviously, metering is a separate issue, but there's a lot of folks who tried to come in prior to the new asylum ban um, and were not able to because they were put on a waiting list, a metering list. Um, and we're trying to argue that those cases shouldn't count. SPLC um, and, and the American Immigration Council and the other lawsuit, you know, expanded to include those types of folks um, with the asylum ban is very problematic. Also, just to make it clear for people, MPP does not involve a credible fair interview. It's a separate part. And so what we're hearing a lot is if people are caught and they're in border patrol custody, what we're hearing from immigration attorneys and families in the U.S. is that border patrol agents allegedly are letting them make a call to say, if you express fear, you're going to be de deported to Mexico um, because there's no critical fear interview. Um, but if you don't express fear, you can get home quicker because asylum's dead, don't you know, and trying to like convince people to give up. Um, we're hearing that very, very frequently. Um, but even if you haven't sought asylum in other countries, you can still qualify for withholding and for cancellation of removal, or I'm sorry, for Convention Against Torture. So you're still permitted to go through the process of MPP. So basically, there are still forms of relief that are related to asylum that people will be eligible for, whether they're sent back to Mexico or allowed into the United States, into detention and possibly out. But it's even a, a more difficult threshold uh, to meet in terms of establishing eligibility for protection as a result of this rule on top of the kind of physical circumstances of being in another country while you're trying to, to prepare your, your case. Good. Okay. I'd also, I'd also say, Didi, sorry, just real quick, for those who live in other parts of the country, for, in the interior, for the detained population, these are some of the last cases for individuals who are going to be eligible for asylum, which means they entered the United States before July 16th. So if you're looking to get involved in this issue, now is the time, looking around at your local legal service providers to see if you can assist. It's a really important time because these are literally some of the last asylum cases that could be heard for a while. One more sort of technical question, and then we'll end with a, with a, a question to all about how people can get involved and, and what kind of advocacy is most needed. Um, but as a technical question, um, Leah, you raised the, the issue of potentially not wanting to terminate cases, what we call in immigration lingo, terminate or end a, a removal proceeding because of some negative impacts that it, that it could have on eligibility for asylum or maybe even eligibility for, for bond in per certain circumstances. But are there cases when people are 
challenging the notice to appear, the charging document in these cases as a way of uh, trying to get people out of the program or to uh, provide greater opportunities to, to present uh, the claim or to hold the government to uh, it, its rules in terms of the way these charging documents are supposed to issue. Have, have people had any successes on that front or are there more warnings about whether that's a wise strategy than, than successes? Um. Of all the cases that I know that have been terminated, it's been it's put the people in a worse place than they were in before the case was terminated. And before MPP, a termination in a court case generally was a good thing because then that would have opened uh, that particular person in most circumstances up to the ability uh, in asylum cases, as we're talking about asylum, to be able to file for an affirmative asylum application instead of be before an immigration judge in court where it's more adversarial. Um, I have yet to come across a case where a termination was beneficial, so I can't speak to that. I'm sure that it's possible that a termination might be beneficial. I think that if you were able to successfully get your client into the released into the United States post termination, then that would be a success because then if they're released into the United States, they have a terminated removal court uh, case then at that point they might be able to try to affirmatively file if jurisdiction doesn't revest in the immigration court um, but or uh, maybe the case will revest in the immigration court meaning the office of chief counsel files a new notice to appear a new charging document and then instigates removal proceedings anew um, but at this point in time i haven't seen any of those cases personally Anybody else have comments on that? Because several of the questions raise the fact that some of the NTAs, the notices to appear, the charging documents that initiate these proceedings are problematic because they don't include a correct address for the respondent. They just mentioned some shelter that the person may or may not have ever been at, or they don't have the proper date that the person initially entered the United States, or they even are putting people into the Remain in Mexico program if they initially cross the river, whereas the statute seems pretty clear that um, it should only apply to people arriving at a bridge, at a, at a port of entry, and even uh, charging the person as both having presented a port of entry without documents and also having crossed uh, irregularly across the river. So it seems like there are numerous problems with many of the NTAs, but it, it may be a difficult strategic and legal call as to whether or not um, it's advantageous in a particular case uh, or in general in challenging the system to raise those issues. Um, anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll comment on that a little bit. It's, it's very problematic. The NTAs are terrible, like you're saying. A lot of NTAs are seeing the address as Facebook, as the address where it's served, or shelters that people have never heard of. Um, very, very wrong NTAs. I think one of the things, and Leah, you can tell me if I'm wrong, in San Diego, I think terminations are perhaps good for folks who don't show up for court as opposed to absential yes. orders. Um, unfortunately, yes. our judges in El Paso are doing about 99% absentia orders, and that means if you don't show up for court, you are deported in absentia. It means you have a mark on your record kind of for the rest of your life, and it means your kids do as well, um, and that's very, very problematic. Um, for folks and in San Diego, luckily the judges tend to be terminating if people don't show up. Um, so our judges, including the judge who's doing the Brownsville cases telephonically is also ordering everyone deported in absentia. Um, terminations are better because then in the future you can maybe come back in. It's particularly better for folks who have um, family members who are US citizens or residents and who can apply for them. So if people are docketed in San Diego and choose not to go for court, and stay in Mexico, and then they can consular process to come back in theoretically without having to request a deportation waiver for that absentia order, as opposed to El Paso, all absentias. It's incredibly frustrating because the um, IOM with the UN is helping get people home, like to get home voluntarily, and they're busing people home. That program is funded by the State Department, and they are not working with ICE or with, um, it with Department of Justice to provide like return home letters um, so that those cases would be terminated as opposed to absentia deportation orders, even though the people went home, which is what we, we want theoretically is for people not to come to the United States. So they did all of those things. And so then that's been really problematic. Apart from this, if the case is terminated, Mexico will not take you back. 
So if you do show up for court and your case is terminated, so if you fight that the NTA is wrong, that person can then not be sent back to Mexico because they're not pending and they're just going to be put into detention. So not all respondents want to be in detention. Um, they're not just going to be allowed free in the U.S., generally speaking. They're going to be put in family detention or single adult detention, and it's really problematic how to move forward. I do believe that one of our colleagues just yesterday in San Diego for the first time got a federal judge um, to help order that some people were released because their case had been terminated against the um, immigration attorney's wishes by one of the judges in San Diego who's terminating everything. Um, and they were actually released, I believe, yesterday was the first release as we've heard of nationwide. So that might take us back. Patricia's information about bond uh, issues and, and the um, I do just want to uh, highlight what you mentioned, Taylor, about the uh, movement uh, by IOM and uh, other UN entities of people away from the northern border of Mexico, uh, potentially back to home countries or at least to the southern border of Mexico. It has become very clear that while that is described as sort of a voluntary repatriation program, in at least some instances, they are folks, asylum seekers who are still interested in pursuing their claims and appearing for their hearings in the border courts uh, for MPP, uh, but that there is no sort of clarity about any ability to come back up to the border for that, that, that uh, while it may be partially sold as a way to just get away from danger in the in the northern border area, it may mean in, in effect that you uh, accepted to return to your home country. Um, okay, so we only have five minutes left. Um, so um, if everybody can do sort of a one minute, uh, what you think people should most get involved with, what advocacy you most need. Let's start with Laura Pena. Sorry. Sure, why not? Uh, if you go to uh, the ABA Commission on Immigration's website on the pro bono link, there's a survey you can take. Uh, we will be following up with individuals uh, about opportunities to volunteer. I would also encourage individuals to go to Project Corazon, which is run by Lawyers for Good Government, and they're looking for uh, volunteer attorneys as well, and they have a lot of work that can be done remotely. So I'd encourage those to for folks to look at those uh, two opportunities and for the humanitarian relief work, again, that's teambrownsville.org. Great. Laura Tool? Uh, we, we would love to have lawyers. Um, yeah, I know it's a hard ask. It's probably, you know, a lot of the work can be done remotely by phone because we can't go into Mexico to meet with our clients. So, you know, it's attending an, a master calendar hearing, you'll get your merits set and then coming back for your merits, you can do all the rest of the work remotely. Um, it's quite an amazing experience to try a case in these tent courts. This is um, history and the making and one, however you look at it, right? Um, and uh, being able to be there and fight for access to the rule of law and uh, for access to counsel and for some form of due process uh, for these folks is is an honor and I would encourage folks to try to come down and um, give us a hand. Great. Leah? Yeah, um, I, there's a number of different organizations. I think what everybody has said is absolutely yes, correct. We will uh, please join up, sign up where you can, travel to the border, get involved. If you can't, uh, try to sign up remotely, do translations, do um, any number of things that you can possibly do depending on where you are situated. Um, one thing that we will be starting uh, beginning November 1st is a formal Know Your Rights Friend of Court program in the San Diego Immigration Court. Our initial launch was pilot. We were testing our limits because we formally requested access to the courtrooms and we were denied. Then we just last this month showed up and started doing it and they've been letting us do it. So uh, we will be formally launching a program in November um, until we are forcibly removed from the courts. So we will have signups um, for that. <laughs> so any attorney who wants to come, spend a week in San Diego or a few days in San Diego and help out with Know Your Rights presentations uh, in the court, we are going to formally launch that in November. Taylor? Yeah, in El Paso, um, Clinic is accepting volunteers, Hayes is accepting volunteers, and Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center are all accepting volunteers for MPP. Um, apart from that, I will just say again, if you're an immigration attorney and across the country, you get a call from someone in this case, think about saying yes instead of saying no. Don't don't just jump into being like, oh, no, I don't practice in Mexico. I don't practice down there. Um, really think about taking on these cases. We need more folks to do it. 
And if you're not an attorney, just speak out against this. It's horrific. Um, try and get congressional change. Patricia, did you want to add anything? Um, I think I'll use my minute to highlight something that I forgot to highlight during the presentation, and that is that the MPP program is really damaging on people with mental health because um, currently there's a litigation, Frank, or there's a case, Franco Gonzalez, that if somebody's been found mentally incompetent by a judge, then they are um, get the right to a court-appointed qualified representative. And unfortunately, um, I feel like there's going to be so many people that are abrogated of that right because they are in the MPP program and are not seen by a judge or people at the detention center. And I'll just uh, wrap us up by echoing a comment that was posted by one of the audience members uh, about the extent to which, in addition to all of this amazing creative representation work that's being done in the most difficult of circumstances and that provides us with critical information about how this program is functioning, we should also be sure to use our voices as witnesses to this um, and even as participants on this call uh, to let the world know, to let the public know what is happening in this program and the extent to which it really goes against basic principles of the rule of law and should not be accepted as normal. We're, I think, as lawyers, problem solvers and, and uh, wanting to provide assistance, and we should absolutely uh, be thinking about ways to do that, uh, but not, I, I think, uh, at the sake of forgetting the, the larger picture of uh, violations of basic civil rights and human rights that are implicated in this program. And so just making sure that we're continuing to talk about that reality as well. But thank you so, so much to the panelists, um, really incredibly informative. Um, and thanks to all of those who were on the, the call as well. And the recording will be sent out. And um, thank you very, very much. We will end the program now. Thank you. Bye, everybody.